Hello and welcome to another online expert interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Mike Lipkin, who is up in Toronto, Canada. How are you doing, Mike? Hey, John, I'm thrilled to be on the uh, podcast with you. Excellent. And Mike has been helping companies uh, for a long, long time. He's helped over 500 companies bring out uh, the best in their people. And he's written some books. He's a well-known speaker. What we wanted to talk about today, though, was his book, which has got the great title of Dancing with Disruption. And he's even got the little uh, dance moves on the cover there, which is it's pretty cool. So before we dive, yeah, exactly. So before we dive into the book, Mike, which will be available yeah. on Sales Pop as well, um, yeah. G- give me a little bit I- of idea, the background to this and why you have the, why it's dancing with disruption and why you're liking it to, uh, to dance. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, John, I came to Canada in uh, 2002 from my uh, native South Africa mm-hmm. and I joined forces uh, in Toronto with a leading Canadian research company called Environics. And together we created a company called Environics Lipkin, which is focused of, Uh, focused on taking our data and translating it into uh, effective uh, leadership and sales strategies for people who want to thrive on change. And so Dancing with Disruption is really the culmination of everything that I've learned in the 18 years that I've been based here in Toronto in uh, alliance with Environics. And um, so uh, the Dancing with Disruption title came from the fact that, number one, we are going through massive disruption. No matter what industry you're in, uh, the status quo is not only being shifted, it's being shattered. So uh, we all have to deal with massive change. But the dancing part of it is really interesting. So, you know, everyone finds a way to survive, uh, specifically in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we'll get through the years and, you know, the life expectancy of the average male is about 80, of the average female is about 84. So, you know, we make it through our four score years or a little bit more. So there's a big difference between surviving and thriving. Now, if you would ask me what the one common denominator is amongst those folks who are thriving, it's that they seem to relish their challenges. Mm -hmm. They seem to enjoy big problems. And they always seem to have an extra gear. They have a joy to them. They have an enthusiasm to them. And the truth is that they're not just coping with life. They're not just managing life. They dancing with it. And so whether they are physically moving or whether they're just having a conversation, you really get a sense that they want to be where they are. And as a result, John, other people want to be with them. And frankly, um, we all want to be other people's preferred partners. Mm -hmm. And because I make a living speaking, just like you, by the way, um, I look up the meaning of words before I use them. And, you know, the Oxford Dictionary defines the word partner as the other person in a dance. So that's where I got the idea of, you know, dancing with disruption, but also making every engagement with you, every conversation with you, not just a random activity, not just a neutral activity, not a certainly not a grudge activity, but one that people really want to look forward to. And so if you someone who dances with disruption, it means not only do you manage it, not only do you resolve issues, but you do it in such a way that you uh, motivate, inspire, and enable other people to raise their game and to help them dance with disruption as well. Because, John, I'll tell you, like anybody Mm -hmm. else, I have my bad days, man. And I got to tell you, what gets me through those bad days is I got people that I call who I know are going to lift me up. Mm -hmm. And I've got at least 300 of those people in my network. And I'm always calling them because they know they can always call me. And together, we dance our way through disruption. Yeah, I think that it's a fantastic analogy, Mike, because I think disruption to a lot of people equates to chaos and lack of control and all those things, you know, which face it, we don't have that much control over our lives anyway. We have a certain amount of control, but not much more. But to dance, right, you have to embrace the music. You got to feel the music. You got to get get to the rhythm of the music. So I love this idea that uh, it's the people who go, okay, so there's this disruption, this chaos, but I'm going to embrace it and I'm going to go with it, right? Right. Well, look, here's the thing. So uh, things are not likely to get stable or more stable anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, As I tell people, things are the most calm they're ever going to be. It only speeds up from here. So if you're waiting for the storm to pass, if you're waiting for 
uh, a return to what some people brand as normality, it ain't going to happen. And so the way we are right now uh, is not only the way it's going to be, it's going to become more intense. We're living in what's called a VUCA environment, which is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be happy, you got to be happy in your current circumstances. you got to embrace whatever's going on in your life. And I tell people that wherever you are right now is the perfect place to be at that moment because that's where you are, right? So here I am. It's uh, just after 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You're out in California. I'm here in the great province of uh, uh, Ontario, Canada. And there's nowhere I'd rather be than having this conversation with you. And so uh, I'm someone who embraces whatever's going on around me because the thing that you mentioned, John, is a very interesting point, and that is we don't have control very often over what the environment's doing. Mm -hmm. And here's what I believe. 50% of the crises in life you cannot anticipate. Right. It's called the way things are. It's, uh, it's surprise after unexpected surprise. But 50% of life you can actually control, and one of those things you can control is your mindset and your attitude because it's become a cliche, but then as people say to me, a cliche is a cliche because it's true, uh -huh. that it's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it. And uh -huh. so I'm ready for whatever happens because I know that um, if I'm confronted with a major crisis, and the one thing I know for certain is I'm going to be confronted with multiple crises uh, even over the next week. Mm -hmm. If I'm at my best in those moments, that's when I win the game. So it's always going to be hard uh, when you're confronted with a major crisis. It always hurts when something happens uh, in a way you don't want it to happen. But here's the interesting thought, John. When something hurts, you know it's making you stronger. You know it's building that resilience. Sure. So I'm one of those guys, I'm not Pollyanna. <laughs> I don't just look for the upside and, and be blind to the downside. I look for the upside and the downside, and then I say, how can I leverage the situation in such a way that I do it differently to anyone else who's competing for the business that I'm competing mm -hmm. for? And frankly, uh, if you're a salesperson, irrespective of what you're selling, you are fundamentally selling yourself first, you're selling your company second, and you're selling your product third. And so, you know, whether we're talking about um, uh, relationship management programs or whether we're talking about motivational speaking or financial products, the actual product itself is a commodity. You are the key differentiator. And so if you're someone who dances with whatever happens to them, then other people are going to want to hang with you because, frankly, uh, we all become the company we keep. And if you think about it, John, we're only as happy as the person to whom we're talking at that moment, yeah. which, by the way, says if you're not talking to someone, you're not going to be happy in that moment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not at my best when I sit by myself in a dark <laughs> room. Things don't go so well for me. Uh, I, I want to hang with people that allow me to have the kind of conversation that I'm having with you because mm -hmm. you are really uh, someone who I think people find it easy to listen to. And you ask great questions. So you ask me a, sim a simple question, and then I go on a rant. <laughs> and I actually have to tell myself when to stop because any one of these questions I could talk for a long time on. Yeah, and, and this is great. And this is exactly what I want you to do. Um, <laughs> the uh, And I like going back for a moment there, right? I mean, I totally agree with you in that the fact is, you know, that we're when we're selling something, you know, generally speaking, we're the we're the differentiator because everything is whether it is really commoditized or whether it's commoditized uh, perception wise by the customer, it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, but come back, uh, not not to, to flog this dance analogy to death or anything, but um, going back to that for a moment, there's if you're not. Uh, passionate and really believe in what you're selling, you're not going to be able to really sell it. Think of it, you think it dance, right? If somebody dances flamenco or the tango with no passion, what's that going to look like? Well, exactly. And uh, so, so here's the thing, um, John, I'm going to take that question as an invitation to walk yeah. people through the seven steps Please of the do. dance. Because you know, for me, there's nothing worse than a passionate person who doesn't know anything, <laughs> right? And we've all been in front of a salesperson or a service representative, and they're passionate. But when you deep dive or when you want to uncover the most important facts, they are ignorant to the facts, and then you realize they're just wasting your time. And mm -hmm. so uh, there's seven steps that empower your passion, as it were. The first step 
is that you want to be the person who really knows. You know, we're living in an age where people are terrified of uh, fake news, where 43 percent of people get their news through Facebook. And we know how that goes. <laughs> so you want to become known as the domain expert. When people talk to you, you want to demonstrate how deeply you understand your subject matter. You want to show your experience. You want to reveal how deeply you understand the customer, the market, the product, the utility they're going to derive from it, because there's no substitute for being that expert uh, and the person that other people can really trust because you're showing your deep level of knowledge and understanding. So that's number one. Yeah, which, number which, two, which before you go to number two, which to be that person requires you to do some hard work, right? It requires you to really that, research the business, the industry, the market, segment, whatever that you're selling into, right? That's right. And that's why, you know, there's so few salespeople who truly become champions because they're not willing to do that hard work. And in fact, John, what I'll tell you uh, is I see a whole lot of people with a lot of talent who are cruising on their talent. Mm -hmm. But frankly, I follow the uh, model of an Olympic athlete. You know, there's no athlete that makes it to the Olympic Games that doesn't have the raw talent. And yet they're also spending five, six, seven hours a day in the pool or on the track or on the field fine their sport and building their stamina. So uh, if you're going to be outstanding, no matter how gifted you are, there's a really high level of work that needs to come along with that. Um, okay, so, so, so that's step one. Step two is what I call be an audacious dreamer. Uh, be someone who has a dream that uh, is so inspiring to you that every time you think about it and every time you share it, you get inspired and you inspire everyone who's listening to you. So my dream over the next 12 months is to move a, a hundred thousand copies of Dancing with Disruption. Mm -hmm. And every time I think of this book being on a hundred thousand desks or in a hundred thousand homes, John, I get really excited because that means a hundred thousand people are going to do something they wouldn't have done because of something that I've written. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've got a slide in my talk where I show an Academy Award and then I've got a number 100,000 times the Academy Award because I want to help 100,000 people win their equivalent mm -hmm. of the Academy Award. And to now, put, when and I to tell put, people that, and to put that sorry, into con and just to put that into context for people is most books sell about 300 copies a year. And that's, that's and, and that and that's you know I think it's something. There's a statistic. I think it's ninety eight percent of books or whatever. So, you know, Mike. So you've set yourself a, a, a really good target. And I and and what I like about this is that uh, not only have you set a target, but you're sharing the target with the world, right? So you're you're giving yourself no no get out of jail card here. Exactly. And you see, that's exactly right, John. Obviously, you've had this kind of conversation before. Because people are scared to share their dream because they're going to be, they're going to be people who just your dream. They're going to be people who tell you that your dream will never happen. However, having said that, there are also people like yourself who are going to help me achieve the dream. And so my message to folks is tell your dream to as many people as possible because someone's going to help you make it happen, number one. Number two, if I share my dream with you, then I encourage you to share your dream with me. So let me turn the tables on you, John. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you, what is what is your dream that you want to achieve in the next year? Um, in the next year? Well, I'll tell you, our ultimate dream, to be perfectly honest, uh, as a company, is we want to create a million new jobs. We want to create a million new sales jobs over the next, like, five years um, by helping people get into sales by being what we call salespreneurs. And that is, you know, people who 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 build their own sales business, you know, whether it's within a company or whether it's on their own, whatever. But that's that's our goal. Our goal is to bring a million more and to spread. And the the ultimate goal of that is to spread prosperity, because we believe um, salespeople uh, can bring prosperity and peace because they're at the tip. They're the tip of the spear for trade. Right. And if people Beautiful. are trading happily, the life is good. Beautiful. So, you know, what we've both done now is exposed yeah. hopefully hundreds of thousands of people to our respective dreams. We've inspired them to dream and they'll buy my book and they'll create new jobs. And we both. Win. So the third step uh, in the uh, Dancing with Disruption moves, if you wish, John, is to be simultaneously analytical and creative. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? Well, we all have a right brain and a left brain. 
Our right brain is our creative brain. Our left brain is our logical, rational, scientific-based brain. And we've got to toggle back and forth. So if I want to move 100,000 of this book, then what I've got to be able to see is the big picture, but I also have to be rooted in the fundamentals. Yeah. So I've got to be able to zoom in and see the dots, but then it's my right brain that connects the dots in extraordinary ways. And the example that I actually give, John, is um, you know, uh, Beyonce is uh, one of my icons. And uh, in December 2013, she launched her album, Beyonce, and she was the first artist to launch her music directly to her audience through iTunes without including a label and without any kind of pre-launch promotion. Mm -hmm. And now that's become a model for many artists. So Beyonce understood the nature of the market, understood the nature of the game, and then saw how she could leverage those facts to revolutionize the music business. And so what I challenge people to do is how can you find the minutia, find the granular opportunities, and then be creative enough to put them together in unique and innovative ways? It's like a recipe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, ingredients are like the facts and the data, but the actual recipe, the way you put it together, that's your creativity. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, sorry, before you go into the fourth one, I just want to underline that one because I think that's a, a superb point for everybody listening because obviously oftentimes you will have a division between the people who consider themselves creative and the people who consider themselves analytical. And exactly. yes, while you might be better at one than the other, while you might prefer to do one than the other, as you say, is you still need to do both. Because otherwise exactly. you'll never bring something you'll never bring something to fruition if you don't have both the creativity but also the analytics, the recipe, the ingredients that go into it. Well, yeah, and you know, here's the very interesting thought, John, is that if you were to say to sales folks, are you more analytical or are you more creative? <laughs> A lot of sales folks would say I'm more creative. Mm -hmm. um, however, they need to be more analytical. By the same token, you talk to a lot of folks who regard themselves as being analytical. And you ask them to share with you something creative that they've done, and they'll blow you away with the examples of how creative they've been. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the important point is to be able to look at the facts as your raw ingredients and then understand that your value to your customers and your clients is to put it together like they've never seen before. You know, the best thing any client can say to me, John, uh, when I say something to them, they say to me, wow. I've never thought of it that way before. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a salesperson representing an organization, representing a service, you live in those facts in a way that your customer doesn't. And so your job and my job is to package things in a way that makes sense and in a way that helps customers do things that they could never do on their own. And so if you do think you're more analytical than creative or more creative than analytical, well, then find people whose skills complement yours. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.